WCW Fall Brawl 95 took place on September 17th, 1995 in Asheville, North Carolina at the Asheville Civic Center. An estimated 95,000 homes purchased the pay-per-view while roughly 6,500 people attended the event. We have got 6 matches on the card tonight with a War Games match headlining the event. Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, Lex Luger and Sting taking on the Dungeon of Doom. In the semi-main spot, Arn Anderson and Ric Flair look to go to war in singles competition. But let's get started with our opening contest, Brian Pillman vs Johnny B. Bad. This is a pay-per-view that wasn't originally covered in the Reliving the War series, so we're going back in time today to fill in a gap in our timeline. I hope you enjoy it. Flan, Brian Pillman and Johnny B. Bad make their way down to the ring and so much time's passed now on Reliving the War that it really feels like a dream or a distant memory watching these guys in WCW again, you know, especially a pre-horseman Flan, Brian Pillman. Michael Buffer explains that this is a number one contender match for a future title shot against The Stinger who at this point was the US champion. A handshake between Mr. B. Bad and Brian gets the match underway. The two trade reversals till Brian takes control with a hip toss followed by a side headlock takeover. A shoulder tackle from Fly and Brian leads to both men performing leapfrogs before cancelling each other out with drop kicks. Both men trade standing wrist locks before Brian hits a snapmare takeover. When they get to their feet, Brian takes Bad down again, but he only gets a two. So far, both men have been on an equal playing field. A Pillman snapmare leads to Johnny reversing for a roll up pin, but Brian's able to get a foot on the rope. More wrist lock action from Johnny B. Bad leads to a Brian Pillman drop toe hold and a pin attempt, but again, he only gets a two. Flying Brian, hoping to start Fall Brawl the right way, applies a chin lock. Excellent. Johnny fights out with an elbow to the midsection, which leads to a Flying Brian head scissors and another pin attempt, and then we go right back to a Brian Pillman chin lock. Easy there, lad. Brian leaps off of Johnny B. Bad after being thrown into the corner, but Johnny's able to capitalize with an arm drag takedown into a headlock. Brian seems to be having trouble fighting out of this one as Johnny keeps up the pressure. Brian is able to get up and hit a backbreaker followed by a Boston Crab. Brian then drops the hold to give Johnny a big punch to the face, busting his nose in the process. Brian grabs Johnny by the hair and starts shouting to the crowd who's a bad man now as he lays in a pretty stiff chop. And are we possibly seeing the beginnings of another heel Brian Pillman? Johnny isn't prepared to give up his momentum just yet though as he performs a tilt award backbreaker. Johnny applies pressure to Brian's knee, he drops an elbow on the same knee. He then transitions into a grounded surfboard stretch, but Brian makes it to the ropes to force a break. The two shove each other, with Brian losing the pushing contest before elbowing Johnny in the face. A chop and a strike in the corner leads to Brian sliding Johnny's face across the ropes, but Johnny replies with a few strikes and Brian decides to leave the ring. Back in the ring, Brian again goes for a handshake, but Johnny refuses and a few clubs to the back by Pillman leads to Johnny getting thrown out of the ring. On the apron, Flan Brian takes a chunk out of Johnny B. Bad's head. He's getting more and more vicious as the match goes on, though Johnny's able to take control once again by smacking Brian's head against the turnbuckle pad before hitting a slingshot leg drop. We get a Johnny B. Bad chin lock and Brian starts fading. Following this, another leapfrog leads to both men colliding and hitting the mat. The crowd cheers Johnny to his feet, but Brian puts him back down with a headbutt and both return to the canvas. The match continues with Brian in control. A few strikes in the corner lead to Brian pushing Johnny out of the ring. As this happens, Michael Buffer can be heard saying that we currently only have 5 minutes remaining on the clock. Both men attempt to suplex one another over the ropes, with Johnny winning out and Brian takes a bump on the floor. Johnny wastes no time, following up with a dive over the ropes onto Pillman. Brian's able to drop kick Johnny B. Bad out of the air when Johnny comes off the top rope. Though Johnny's able to hit a sit down powerbomb, but it only gets a two. Both men have been putting their all into this match and it's been really good so far. Brian responds with a tombstone pile driver as Michael Buffer gives us a time check. Only three minutes remain in the opening contest. Brian's tornado DDT attempts countered when Johnny throws Flan Brian to the canvas. Curiously, Johnny puts Brian in an arm stretch with only two minutes remaining. Even Shivani and Heenan wonder why he'd put Brian in a submission this late in the game. He lets go of the hold and he attempts his finisher, but Brian counters with a Russian leg sweep and a submission hold of his own. With less than two minutes remaining, Brian hooks the arm and he places Johnny in a grounded abdominal stretch. With one minute remaining, Nick Patrick checks if Mr. B. Bad's knocked out from Pillman's submission but he's still in it. In the final 30 seconds, Johnny plants Brian's face to the canvas and he hits the future loose cannon with a 2D fruity, but his pin attempt only nets him a 2 as Brian's arms underneath the ropes. 
Johnny thinks he's won, and Brian's looking to catch Johnny by surprise with a springboard clothesline. But again, we only reach a two count as Michael Buffer counts down to zero. The time expires as Brian attempts another pin. This means the match is a draw. Nick Patrick lets Michael Buffer know that the match must continue and there has to be a winner. The crowd goes wild when they hear the announcement. Brian takes the initiative with charges to the midsection, a few strikes in the corner and he even bites Johnny's head. Johnny fights back and both competitors head to the outside. There's a little back and forth here that leads to Johnny crashing into the guardrail. And back in the ring both men again cancel each other out with drop kicks. Brian applies a sleeper, Johnny buckles under, he hits the canvas but he's able to make it to the ropes. Johnny then applies a sleeper of his own but it's countered with a back suplex. Brian puts Johnny on the top rope before giving him a slap in the face. Brian's attempt at a superplex leads to a counter and Johnny hits Brian with a diving sunset flip but he only scores a two. Brian then attempts a crucifix but Johnny counters, smashing Brian to the ring back first. Brian hits that tornado DDT but when he goes to the top rope his little loose cannon gets smashed on the top turnbuckle as a dazed Johnny B. Bad runs into the ropes. Johnny throws Pillman off the turnbuckle and he crashes head first into the guardrail. Johnny then performs a somersault senton before bringing it back into the ring to perform the bad mood, but Bran gets his legs up, destroying Johnny's ribs in the process. Johnny gets draped over the top rope with a front suplex and as Johnny attempts to recover on the outside, Flan Brian dives through the middle ropes but he doesn't quite make it to Johnny. Both men crawl to the ring and Pillman goes for a springboard attack but he ends up getting crotched on the top rope. Johnny attempts a pin but Brian is in position correctly. Both men dodge clotheslines before they crash into each other when trying crossbodies. Johnny's first to make the pin and Johnny B. Bad wins the opening contest at Fall Brawl. I liked how both men started out as faces but slowly through the match you saw Brian transition into more of a heel. It was subtle at first but with each passing moment he got more and more vicious. Johnny was great too and both his athleticism and his ability to feed into the crowd. Outstanding performance from both men. The addition of the 20 minute time limit also didn't feel like a hindrance to the match and it complemented the story being told in the ring. It felt like it added more drama to the contest. Whatever you do, do not skip this opening match. Next up we have a potential barn burner between Sergeant Craig Pittman and Cobra. Cobra attempts his best hitman impersonation by handing some lucky kid his trademark and patent and dog tags as he makes his entrance. Craig Pittman does not appear at first, instead he sends one of his lower enlisted. He has no rank visible but Shivani later confirms he's just a private. Mind games are being played by Sergeant Craig Pittman. Pittman does his best stinger impression as he slides down from the rafters and he low crawls over to the distracted Cobra. Using his ammo belt Pittman takes advantage by choking Cobra out and he follows this up with strikes and kicks before throwing Cobra out of the ring. Pittman leaps at Cobra maintaining the advantage but a counter from Cobra sends Pittman into the turnbuckles. A diving attack leads to a Pittman counter and Cobra lands face first on the canvas. We see the code red arm breaker and Pittman wins the match. Amazing, feel free to skip this one, you'll miss nothing, nothing at all. We see a video package of Mr. Wonderful having a breakdown in the back after losing a previous match to Randy Savage. Gary Spivey of the Psychic Network enters the dressing room and tells Orndorff that he has a vision of great things for Mr. Wonderful. Spivey attempts to convince Mr. Wonderful that he is indeed Mr. Wonderful and after his pep talk, Mr. Wonderful confirms that yes, in fact, he is Mr. Wonderful and he gives himself a kiss in the mirror. Uh, Alright, the confusion's plastered all over over Tony Schiavone's face. Next up we have a TV title match between challenger DDP and champion Renegade. And boy oh boy is that an outfit for DDP or what? Night and day when you consider where we are now and reliving the war isn't it? We start things off with a DDP cheap shot as the Renegade takes a kick to the midsection followed by a few elbows in the corner and we see a DDP Russian leg sweep. A headbutt from DDP does more damage to the master of the diamond cutter, sending him out of the ring and into the audience. It's all renegade on the outside as he slams DDP's head on the apron before throwing him back in the ring. DDP begs for mercy but he uses this advantage to toss renegade into the turnbuckle pad but renegade returns the favour before applying a side headlock. 
Paige, for some reason, goes out of the apron and he ends up getting unceremoniously dumped back in the ring. A lariat forces Paige back to the mat. The renegade's able to dodge a clothesline, but when he jumps at Paige, he accidentally flies face first into the ropes, causing damage to his neck. DDP chokes out the renegade using the top rope before snapping his neck over the same rope. A disgruntled Kimberly says that was a 10. A swinging neckbreaker leads to another 10 getting held up by Kimberly, and the renegade ends up getting thrown out of the ring. A headbutt to the midsection from Paige gets followed up by a renegade sunset flip, but the match continues on. DDP hits a lariat and a charging headbutt to the renegade. But when Dallas attempts the same thing in the opposite corner, the renegade dodges and DDP rams his shoulder into the ring post. The renegade hits two running clotheslines, followed by a cartwheel body attack. He goes to the top rope to hit DDP with a double axe handle, and Paige responds with a jawbreaker, followed by a fantastic looking DDT. DDP attempts the diamond cutter, but the renegade throws Paige away. Renegade rolls Dallas up, but he only gets a two. Max Muscle's attempt at interfering causes disaster for Dallas. The two collide when Paige was being thrown off the ropes, leading to a renegade power slam, and curiously, instead of capitalizing on Page, the renegade instead climbs the top rope and he dives on Max Muscle. This gives Dallas time to recover. Maybe Renegade wanted to save his best mate Jimmy Hart, I don't know. DDP begs for mercy, but this was a ploy to distract Renegade long enough for Max to grab his leg. We see the diamond cutter, and not only do we have a new TV champion, but this is also DDP's first title win in WCW. DDP celebrates as Kimberly looks on in disappointment. She'll need to check her zodiac to see if there's any potential upside or perhaps a new beefcake in her future. You know what I'm saying? Not a bad performance from Paige, but he was still clearly way, way off from the man he would eventually evolve into later on. The match was nothing special, but if you're a big DDP fan, you'll definitely get a kick out of watching him win his first title. The WCW Tag Team titles are up for grabs as challengers Harlem Heat take on the team of Bunkhouse Bug and Dick Slater, managed by future robot monster commander Colonel Robert Parker. Parker and Cherry are going through a bit of a lover's dilemma at the moment. Their will-they-won't-they they romance has led to this tag team match and, yeah, riveting stuff from a storyline perspective. Things are heated between the two teams before the bell rings. We start off with Booker T and Dick Slater. Booker takes a knee in the corner before sending Dick into the opposite corner, following up with a clothesline. After some words of encouragement from Bunkhouse, Dick gets back in there and he hits a drop toe hold, and he briefly puts Booker in a cross face. Some double team action from Harlem Heat when Stevie Ray gets tagged in leads to a body slam on Dick followed by an elbow drop. In the corner, Dick takes a few clubbing blows before getting put on a side headlock. Booker T trades places with Stevie Ray but this leads to Bunkhouse Bug making the tag and Booker gets punished a little in the opposition's corner. Bug applies a front chancery, but Booker's able to push him into Harlem Heat's corner and Stevie gets tagged in. A Stevie Ray reverse chin lock leads to more double team action from Harlem Heat as a returning Booker hits Bunkhouse with his signature sidekick. We get a Booker T chin lock immediately after as Bunkhouse fights back with a shoulder block and Booker comes back with a leapfrog and a hip toss. Stevie Ray and Dick Slater are tagged in and at the corner Stevie lays in a few strikes before taking a weak atomic drop from Dick followed by a few chops. Slater pulls off a swinging neckbreaker and Stevie replies with a headbutt followed by some more choking on the canvas. Stevie performs a nerve pinch on Dick before tagging in brother Booker. Booker ends up taking a kick to the back before being thrown out of the ring. On the outside, Booker's assaulted by Bunkhouse Buck before returning back to the ring. And more double team action from the champs leads to Booker taking a ton of punishment between both men. Booker gets choked in the corner before he takes a Russian leg sweep. Dick gets Booker up for a pile driver, eventually. And more quick tags leads to Booker getting sent back to the outside to receive more damage from Dirty Dick. We continue to build to that Stevie Ray hot tag as Booker takes a big boot followed by a reverse chin lock. Booker, able to withstand the deadly arts of chin lockery, gets to his feet when Buck transitions into a camel clutch. With Bunkhouse on his back, Booker slams the Buck out of his opponent into the turnbuckle. Dick Slater comes back in and he starts some shit with Stevie Ray, distracting the referee and allowing Dick to hit a back suplex on Booker. Booker takes a knee to the face and we see a couple of pin attempts, all of which get a two. A somewhat sloppy body slam from Buck leads to Dick coming back in to hit a swinging neckbreaker followed by a Boston Crab, but Booker stays in it. Stevie's finally had enough, he takes matters into his own hands and Slater takes a big boot to the head. Unfortunately, this leads to Booker taking more punishment as Buck illegally comes in and he applies a half-boss and crab. 
Things finally start to look up for Harlem Heat as Booker hits a scissors kick and Stevie finally gets the hot tag, utterly decimating the champs in the process with strikes, clubs, body slams and a power slam. Booker comes back in and he goes to work on Dick in the corner while Stevie's thrown outside by Buck. Booker takes a double punch from the champs as Stevie crawls back into the ring. As Harlem Heat then begin beating the crap out of the champions, we see sensational Sherry crawling over to Robert Parker in the other ring. While Sherry and Robert Parker share an intimate moment, the nasty boys interrupt the match and they nail Slater with his own boot. This leads to Harlem Heat winning the match and Harlem Heat are the new tag team champions. All the attentions put on Sherry and Parker during the celebration as Bunkhouse airs his displeasure to the colonel. Sherry, meanwhile, tells Harlem Heat that this was her strategy all along. I uh, honestly found this match a slog to get through. Dick Slater and Bunkhouse Buck aren't the most charismatic wrestlers in the world and it's very easy to find better Harlem Heat matches too. Not great at all, I'm afraid. In our semi-main spot we have Ric Flair taking on Arn Anderson. We are shown a package that highlights the turmoil brewing between the Enforcer and the Nature Boy. The horsemen are falling apart, Anderson believes his old friend lost his touch ever since Hulk Hogan came along. In during tag matches, Anderson and Flair have failed to work as that well-oiled machine that they once were. After the video package, Arn cuts a promo where he says whether you love him or hate him, he'll always call a spade a spade. He says his stomach's been in knots and his heart's been pounding out of his chest because he has to trade fists with someone he loves more than God itself. He says win, lose or draw, the enforcer has to look in the mirror in the morning and he has to respect himself, not kiss himself like Paul Orndorff. And he's gonna make sure that Flair respects him too after this match. Rick and Arn make their way down to the ring and we see a few shots of other WCW competitors sitting at ringside, all of which had competed in matches already or they competed in dark matches before the show went on the air. It makes the match feel a little more big. Rick starts nation before the two eventually lock up. Arn takes a shoulder charge while Flair falls victim to a drop toe hold. Arn then taunts Flair and we get a stare down between the two former horsemen. Both men decide against a test of strength, opting for a lockup instead. Arn applies a standing headlock before hitting Flair with a shoulder charge. Rick gets back on his feet and Arn slaps him across the face, catching the nature boy off guard and causing him to retreat outside the ring. After taking a moment to breathe, Flair comes back in for some wrist lock action but the enforcer quickly counters the nature boy, punishing Flair's left arm with knee shots and kicks. Both men trade slaps again and Arn slaps harder than Rick. Rick hits the mat and his reactions afterwards are spot on and Bobby Heenan wonders what's wrong with Ric Flair right now. Flair briefly puts Arn in a front chancery but again Arn counters, this time with a hammerlock. Arn's not giving Flair an inch in this competition. They stay on the ground for a while before briefly trading headlocks, Anderson takes a flare chop which sends him right back to the mat and the nature boy continues his assault by focusing on Arn's knee. We see another vicious chop to Arn but an elbow to the face allows the enforcer to go up to the top rope. After poking flare in the eye, Anderson decides to put flare in a sleeper instead of going airborne but flare quickly breaks the hole by ramming the enforcer into the turnbuckle. Flair thinks he's bought himself some time but the enforcer once again climbs to the top rope and Flair takes a flying knee shot. Arn performs a hammerlock slam and he continues to stretch out the nature boy. Rick tries to fight out with a few big chops but Anderson uses Rick's hair to bring the nature boy back down. The enforcer remains in control as he drags Rick to the corner and he slaps Flair's arm into the ring post on the outside. And back inside, Anderson continues to apply pressure to that left arm. Flair works his way up and into the corner to deliver one of the loudest chops I have ever heard in my life. This pisses the enforcer off and Arn throws the nature boy into the corner before laying in a few punches. We see the corner bump but Rick pulls the ropes down and Arn flies out of the ring. Flair hits a double axe handle off the top rope before delivering another monstrous chop against the guardrail. Back in the ring, Flair performs his classic knee drop. He attempts to use the ropes for leverage during a pin attempt but to no avail. Arn blocks a Ric Flair punch and it's the nature boy who ends up taking a few punches in the corner and Slick Rick then takes a back body drop. Flair resorts to begging for mercy. The enforcer is not in the mood for showing compassion but referee Randy Anderson stops Arn from punching Rick in the face. This leads to the nature boy hitting a low blow. Randy asks Flair if he just smashed the enforcer's balls with his fist and Rick says no, absolutely not. Flair throws Anderson outside the ring again and delivers another chop. A rake to the aisle allows Anderson to backdrop Rick. 
Arn attempts a suplex, but Flair counters with a suplex of his own, and back in the ring, Arn takes another big suplex from the Nature Boy. Both men are now spent, and gotta say, I'm enjoying this one. I won't lie, I've watched it a few times before, but it's still fun to revisit. More chops are delivered to the Enforcer, leading to a sunset flip attempt by Anderson. Flair doesn't fall and he tries to deliver a punch, but Arn's able to dodge Flair's attack. Rick's face gets dragged across the top rope before we again see the corner bump, but this time the Nature Boy gets hung up in the Tree of Woe, and Arn punishes Rick with kicks and chokes before signaling for the DDT. Arn goes for that DDT, but he's unsuccessful. Rick held onto the ropes, but we still see the flare flop afterwards. Rick goes up top and you know what happens next, he gets slammed from the top turnbuckle, though Flair catches Arn with a clothesline as the enforcer comes off the top turnbuckle and this leads to the figure 4. Rick punches Arn's knees and he spits in Anderson's face, a pissed off enforcer uses his momentum to reverse the figure 4 on Flair, the two get up and a chop gets blocked by the enforcer and this leads to a small package but Flair's not ready to give up just yet. He manages to kick Arn in the back of the knee to soften it up for another figure 4 attempt. Flair continues to work over the body part and he delivers more strikes and chops in the corner. Things are now looking bad for the enforcer, but our match comes to an abrupt end when Brian Pillman, of all people, jumps on the apron to distract Flair. Everyone's shocked as Brian and Flair trade punches and eventually the Nature Boy takes a kick to the back of the head. This in turn is followed up by Arn's DDT and Arn Anderson defeats Flair via pinfall. We see a mixed reaction from the crowd, some fans are cheering, some are booing, but the ending was definitely interesting. The commentators aren't sure if Pillman was helping Arn or if he just wanted to attack Flair for his own personal reasons, but it's a big win for the enforcer at Fall Brawl. The match was solid with the kind of action you'd expect from these two. There are quite a few holds that go on a bit longer than they probably should have though, that's the only real complaint. Still, this is the beginning of the Nitro era of the Horsemen and it's a solid showing overall from both men. It's time for the main event, the Hulkamaniacs consisting of Hogan, Savage, Sting and Luger versus the Dungeon of Doom consisting of Ming, Kamala, the Zodiac and the Shark. We have got Jimmy Hart and the Taskmaster managing teams respectfully. Hogan's enlisted the help of his closest allies and friends to take on the Dungeon of Doom. We see a video package with Sullivan talking a bunch of nonsense and to sum it up, the Dungeon of Doom are gonna destroy Hulkamania tonight once and for all in war games. We then cut over to earlier in the evening when the giant ran over Hulk Hogan's Harley Davidson in a monster truck, a classic moment in pro wrestling history. During the Hulkamaniacs video package, we see that Vader was originally slated for the team but he'd gone AWOL. In reality, Vader got fired after a backstage altercation with Paul Orndorff. So Lex Luger takes Vader's spot. Luger joined the Hulkamaniacs on the condition that he'll get a shot at Hulk Hogan's WCW Championship sometime down the line. Sting vouches for Luger of course, but can he really be trusted? Let's find out in War Games 1995. The Hulkamaniacs cut a backstage promo before they head to the ring. They are decked out in their finest olive and dark green colours, perfect for blending in with grey steel cages. The Hulkamaniacs ultimately say they are hyped, and I'm hyped too, let's get this started. Lex confirms that he's all in with the Hulkamaniacs and everyone's just so amped up. Some top quality sniff must have been backstage at Fall Brawl. We go back to the arena where Mean Gene runs down the rules for war games as the cage descends around the two rings. And I always think it's a good idea to go over the rules for new viewers because war games has changed a lot in modern times. There are 7 periods in war games, the first period lasts 5 minutes and all other periods last 2 minutes. One man from each team enters during the first period. After the first period ends, the referee flips a coin. The team that wins the toss sends in its second man. After the second period ends, the other team sends in their second man, making war games 2 on 2. Teams alternate during remaining periods until all 8 men are in the ring and then the match beyond begins. Surrender or submission is the only way to win, there are no pinfalls, counter or disqualifications. As a little bonus this year, if the Hulkamaniacs win, then Hogan's gonna get 5 minutes all alone with the Taskmaster inside the cage, and Hogan can have his way with Mr. Sullivan. My my. The 
The teams make their way down to the cage and starting off we're going to see Sting of the Hulkamaniacs taking on the Shark in the first period of War Games. We start with Shark giving the Stinger a few clubbing blows to the back before Sting takes a snap mare. The Shark uses his way to crush the Stinger's sternum by walking over him. The Shark continues to dominate Sting by putting him in the corner and uh, chewing on him. A, a, a shark bite ladies and gents. The Hulkamaniacs watch on as Sting dodges a shark splash in the corner before following up with a few strikes. Shark attempts to flee to the second cage but Sting isn't going to let him off that easily and he dives from one cage to the other, crashing down on the big man. Sting stays in control with a few more strikes and a big body slam. A second body slam attempt isn't as successful though. Shark attempts to squeeze the life out of Sting with a bear hug. It's not a good sign when you're going for a bear hug this early on. After quite a while, Sting fights his way out though and he takes a bite out of the shark before going over to the other ring. Shark attempts to dive over the ropes but uh, he doesn't make it. The Stinger takes advantage by delivering a bunch of kicks to the shark's gut. The shark catches a stinger splash and he throws Sting back into the other ring. Shark then tries to pose but he gets his nut smashed on the top rope when the stinger kicks his ankle. Sting applies a death lock just as the timer reaches zero and next in for the dungeon of doom it's the zodiac. Sting uses the cage above to kick zodiac before hitting a body slam but he then makes the mistake of attempting a scorpion death lock and the shark makes him pay with a big elbow drop. The shark and Zodiac then work together on the stinger, performing a shark leg drop and a double clothesline on the icon. Sting dodges the second double clothesline before he takes out the Zodiac, but the shark stays up and Sting gets clobbered. The second Hulkamaniac comes in, it's Macho Man Randy Savage. Savage cleans house and he even attempts to suplex the shark. He quickly realizes it ain't gonna happen so he instead focuses on Zodiac. Meanwhile, the Dungeon of Doom have grabbed the whole of Sting, making it impossible for him to get up and assist Savage in this fight. Sting eventually gets free and all four men trade blows until the third member of the DoD enters war games and we've got Kamala. The big man immediately goes after Sting, he gives him a double chest chop before attempting to choke the Stinger out. Meanwhile Savage punches the Zodiac before taking an atomic drop from the shark as things look bleak for the Hulkamaniacs. Help comes in the form of a package, a total package that is, as Lex Luger enters war games and he clears out the dungeon of doom. He hits a double clothesline on Kamala and Shark and he teams up with Savage to throw Zodiac into the cage. Macho hits a double axe handle on the Shark as things now look a bit brighter for the Hulkamaniacs. However, Lex accidentally hits Randy Savage after the Zodiac ducks a clothesline attempt. This causes the two to brawl and Sting tries to keep the pace. I knew that total package couldn't be trusted. Unfortunately, Lex and Savage pick the worst possible time to bicker as the ultimate challenge is about to step into war games. Ming enters the battle as the fourth and final member of the Dungeon of Doom. Ming comes in and he decimates the Hulkamaniacs with kicks, punches and headbutts and once again the Doomers are back in control. Savage and the rest take a beating as Hogan watches on worried about his teammates. He needs to get in there and he needs to fight for what's right, you know. After a long two minutes of the Dungeon of Doom kicking the Hulkamaniacs asses, Hogan finally enters the ring and the match beyond begins. Hogan starts it off by throwing dust in the eyes of Ming, Zodiac and Kamala before laying punches into the shark. No mercy spared to the Doomers as the Zodiac gets caught in a feedback loop, taking punch after punch and bouncing between both sets of ring ropes before Hogan ultimately takes a bite out of his face. There's a lot of biting in this war games match. The focus is mostly on Hulk now as he bounces between each member of the Dungeon of Doom. Big Shark takes a clothesline in the corner, Zodiac gets his back scratched by his old mate before getting punched in the face. The Hulkamaniacs are completely dominating the match now with most of the Dungeon of Doom just laying around at this point. I'm not gonna lie, this match beyond's been pretty subpar. Actually the whole War Games match hasn't been good at all. Hogan and Lex double team members of the Dungeon of Doom by throwing them into the cage. At this point you almost feel bad for the Dungeon of Doom because they're just mercilessly getting beaten up by the Hulkamaniacs. But it all finally comes to an end when Hogan makes the Zodiac give up to a camel clutch. It's… it's not good. It's laughable how the dungeon completely crumbled the moment Hogan got in the ring. Some sort of resistance would have given a better payoff but there you have it. The Hulkamaniacs are victorious in the 1995 war games match and it easily ranks up there as one of the worst war games matches of all time. Not the worst in my opinion but it's up there. The Taskmaster attempts to flee the premises but highly trained security forces bring him back to the ring. He must face Hogan per their extra stipulation. 
Hogan stalks Sullivan before he launches an attack, sending the Taskmaster back and forth to opposite ends of the cage before Kevin tries to escape. Hogan follows him outside momentarily before bringing him back in so the beating can continue. Sullivan has no chance as Hogan hits a clothesline and a big boot, but then a deranged big giant walks down to the ring to help Sullivan. Giant grabs Hogan by the neck, but Hogan fires back with a few punches before being stopped again by the big man. Per the Taskmaster's orders, Giant then proceeds to snap Hogan's neck in the middle of the ring. The Hulkamaniacs return to check on their fallen leader, and that's how Fall Brawl 95 comes to an end. It's a tragic ending for all the Hulkamaniacs across the world, brother. Watch Fall Brawl 95 for Pillman vs Johnny B. Bad and to a lesser extent Flair vs Anderson, the rest you can do without. It's not a good show at all but you will have a good time with the opening match. If you want to continue on from here and see what happens next, you'll want to head right back to the beginning of Reliving the War as this show happened right at the start of the series. It's pretty fascinating to see how far WCW would come in just a few years. Thanks for watching this Reliving the War pay per view review though, it's another chance to cover some of the shows that were missed at the beginning of the series, and the other missing shows will get covered in the future. Thanks again for watching, and please take care.